Well, um, it was, I feel in a way like uh, we, we stopped the cocktail party and then we got to have a little diversion and go back. But uh, I just wanted to personally, Jesse, as, as well as in the family and certainly in the business in all always uh, just say welcome to Gumtree Bookstore and we are so proud to have you as our latest greatest author and uh, we're delighted to, to be able to celebrate the book with you and Francis and Mill, Claude, everybody. Our Tupelo, you, you, you bring a spotlight to Tupelo through that relationship so we're, we're proud that Tupelo is, uh, gets to host you on your world tour from Brooklyn to San Francisco to Tupelo to other spots in in the world but um, I, I think that uh, we all those are, I, I'm lucky enough to have read the book in fact Jesse passed that to y'all some of you know we know I like to underline and highlight and everything so I've, got, I, I've underlined probably a third of the book of passages that I thought were important uh, and not that the rest of it's not but um, you know one of the things that in reading the book that I think is just going to be so tremendous for anybody that does read it is it it really speaks to so many different uh, people in so many different ways and in categories I mean obviously people that are interested in um, life and in Jesse's own personal life that her memoir I mean, that's that's a memoir just as a memoir is a, is a wonderful book then for, for uh, people who are, are looking at the, at their family relationship of what that can look like could look like doesn't look like um, it, it's it's just so informative and it's so um, it's so honest which is makes it there's some really sad parts of it of course to to uh, to read through and I just uh, are related to this. This was something, for example, it could be any eighth grader, but um, yeah, I think seventh and eighth grade is pretty tough. And one of uh, I remember one of the things you, one of the things you read that I just uh, sometimes I tear up. I think I have a trouble with something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was that little? Uh, in the, we go in the bathroom and saw your name at the bottom of the popularity list, and that reminded me of a walk that I had to the Rockwell Youth Center, and Lisa knows this story, but I was walking with some of my friends in eighth grade, guys and girls, we were walking to this youth center around Joyner School, about six or seven, and one of the girls looked down at me and said, you know, Jack, the reason nobody likes you. <laughs> and I, I didn't even hear the reason, because I said, nobody? I said, nobody likes me? And she said it so casually, you know, so it was kind of knowledge around the school, that, you know, nobody likes me. So, uh, so I was glad to get out of eighth grade too. But, uh, I liked you, John. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> well, you were older than you were wiser than my class. Bob was Bob was the senior patrol leader in the troop, so you know, I was just a, a tender foot. But anyway, all that to say that it just there, there are things in it that are universal uh, parts of the book, as well as profound insights into what you do. I'm not going to take any more of her time, but I just thought I'd let Francis uh, and Jesse maybe later but Jesse right now talk just a little bit about the, the process the project and then if we had any questions and answers and then we go right back to signing so so thank you Jack and everybody at Reeds for hosting me and um, uh, you know the first time I came to Tupelo we haven't been dating for very long but Francis was like if the, if this is maybe even a little bit maybe serious, you have to meet my grandfather right away. And I was like, that's a kind of tall order. I've never been to Mississippi, but okay. And so I came down for a weekend. We've been dating maybe six months or so. And I showed up on the front door of the family home on Friday evening. It was Camille's home. And her, her granddaddy was like sitting there on the porch waiting for me. And he was, was he 90 yet? Maybe 88, 89 years old, just like, you know, regal looking man, and um, he was like, I'm so happy to meet you. And that has always felt like Tupelo's sort of front door welcome to me, and I'm just so grateful for that. Um, and I just I just wanted to explain a second how this book came to be, because I think understanding that is, is part of sort of Tupelo's contribution to it and to our family. So in spring of 2020, um, and forgive me if you've heard this, a couple of you have, but 
Um, I was living in Brooklyn, New York with my wife in a really crappy one and a half bedroom ground floor apartment that we loved quite a lot with a new baby. And I was a finance and tech writer and um, I felt like I knew who I was. I, you know, I traveled all the time. I was like an extroverted, love to talk about like the financials of Google, would love to tell you about Mark Zuckerberg and what he really thought about it at night, which was, by the way, just Facebook. <laughs> and that's what I did, right? And then there was the pandemic. And overnight, everything I thought I understood about myself just shifted. And um, things got scary in New York, and we didn't we knew we probably shouldn't be there. Like, I remember opening the paper and seeing that Rhode Island was checking license plates to see who was coming in from New York. And I thought, well, we got to get out of here before we can't. Like, I, it was only a minute, and it seems sort of funny now, but two years in the future, but like, it was very scary. And so without thinking too much about it, we put our dog and our baby and everything we could fit into our Subaru and drove down to spend a week with Camille and Crofton. And four months later, we were still here. <laughs> and, um, and during that time, there were a lot of long days um, when we got a lot of help with our baby. Um, and when like the work kind of dried up, I was lucky that I didn't lose my job, but there wasn't a lot to do. And all the things that made me feel like I knew who I was changed. And I had this like, lovely literary agent in New York who said, you know what, now's a great time to write a book. I'm like, when am I supposed to write a book? And bake bread and play ukulele. Like, I'm tired. Like, I don't want to write a book. Um, but also, I've always wanted to write a book. And so I said, sure, I could write about Uber. And she was like, no, think bigger. No one cares about Uber. And I was like, artificial intelligence. And she was like, all that stuff will always be there. What is the, like, the dream you want to write? Like, what is the book you would never take on? Let's try that. And so sitting in Camille and Crofton's den, for the most part, I wrote up a pitch. What if I try to write about what it was like for every single person in my family to come out of the closet? I mean, I thought that was a pretty good gimmick. Like, we all came out as, as some form of queer, except my mom, but I could just sort of leave her out. And I thought, you know, like, people would want to read that. And um, what I what I proposed to do is I said, okay, so if, if we do that, like what I'll, what I'll do is I'll call and interview each of my family members. I don't think I really thought about exactly how difficult it would be to call the people that I'm closest to and know the best and ask them to tell me everything they could remember about growing up with me. It wasn't always flattering. Um, but you know, that seemed on the face of it like an interesting challenge. Interesting enough that there was a market for it in New York also sitting in the den and then like wandering into the kitchen be like okay well this editor is interested and this editor is interested and literally before we could blink um i had sold a book and the funny thing about writing a book is that you do it by yourself and i am an extrovert i'm out in the world and um you know we sold this book and then i like called the editor and i was like great okay let's go and he was like why are you calling and i was like well uh, you this book we've got and he was like okay, give it to me in 18 months. If you need anything before then call me. And then it was like me alone in a room while Francis was in the other room watching our child and some children. Um, and fast forward, I did interview everybody in my family. I did write a book about how we all came out. And what I learned is that the coming out part was the least interesting thing in our family. Um, I think I learned a lot and I hope this book has a lot to say about what it is like to try to actually love the people that you're closest to. It is so hard, right? And to do that over the course of a lifetime. Um, it is, I think, the challenge of our humanity and the thing that makes us human. And um, I can't really think of anything else to say except that I wanna, <laughs> like, I wanna thank, profoundly thank my two below family for enabling this project in every way. From making a starting place for the project to, um, are you checking your phone while I'm talking? It was, so the, phone it was the phone that. <laughs> yeah. It was my fault that the phone dinged and I tried to be subtle and wasn't. <laughs> um, but for modeling what it means to, to like love and show up with family every day so gracefully um, and for giving me the support to go to the deepest, darkest places I could find and shed light on them and then for gathering to celebrate once it was done. So thank you for that. And I, I would love to, if, if people have questions, and we're all here together, I, we probably don't have a ton of time, um, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if folks have questions, I'd Yeah, I'd add, so that. I think we've got some, some time. I think I'm looking around the people here who would love to take, I don't know, people may have to get back to work in a little while, but 
Um, any anybody particular questions? You know, Jesse, I'll I'll start off. One of the things that uh, uh, that I was interested in in, in uh, reading was was the I guess the order of asking the different family members and was it a who how how did that work how, from just a practical standpoint how does one interview one's closest family members and still move it move it along um not everybody was game right away everybody was game before i sold the book like i didn't i didn't take the book to market until I, everybody was game but you know my little brother and i had done a project like this for time magazine in 2016. he is a transgender man he had carried a baby and I interviewed him about that pregnancy and wrote about it. And it was this great process because the thing is like, I'm an oldest child and I know everything. I don't even think I know everything. I just know everything. And that included knowing everything about my brother's life. And so then to put my journalist hat on and to ask open-ended questions and listen to the answers without trying to intervene and tell him what he should be thinking was profound and it ended up making us a lot closer. And so when I said, I want to do this in a bigger way, he was all in. Um, we're a lot alike, my brother and I. You know, sometimes you have a family member that is like maybe genetically programmed. You just kind of see the world in the same way. Um, my sister was a lot more cautious because she's a very private person and she was smart enough to understand that even if she trusted her story to me, I would still be the narrator so I get to choose what went in it. Um, but she eventually came through. My dad loves any story about himself. <laughs> so, um, and my mom was, my mom and I had the most difficult relationship, but she was the first person to say yes. Um, and um, when you read the book, you will think that she's very brave because there were things about her own history that were very painful to us. And I tried to respect and exercise great compassion um, around telling my mom's story and to give it the context that it deserves, in part because no matter what anyone thinks of my mom, at the end of the day, she's a woman who loves me enough to say, yeah, if you would like to tell a few hundred thousand people what it was like to grow up in our house, that's fine. <laughs> so. uh, anybody? Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Did you let them like approve the book before you? That's a great question. It? Yeah. My editor said, absolutely don't <laughs> let them read it. Um, and then I said, well, that's not how I'm going to do it because I want to really go deep here. Like, I want to really get in there. And the only way I can feel comfortable ethically doing that is if everybody gets to read it before you see it. And so after every couple of chapters, I'd send the chapters all around. And my brother, my sister, and I, we all had babies during the pandemic. Or rather, Francis had the baby. I, I was the second parent, but I didn't do the physical part. But my brother and my sister each also had infants. And um, so they didn't really read anything. They just kept nodding, nodding, nodding. Yeah. And at the end, they were like, oh, I should have read that. That thing you wrote was just right. Um, but my, my parents in particular would call and be like, you know, let's edit this part. Or, or they would be like, you know what? You said that dinner happened in 1982. And dad would be like, yeah, but it happened in 1993. And mom would be like, well, no, but it never happened. And that's, that's like, when you ask five people to tell a story, even when everybody is trying their best, like memory is, memory is a faulty tool, right? And it doesn't serve us. And when we go for fact, we lose every single time. And I think like the book gave me like, full knowledge of the fact that what matters is the emotional truth, and you can hit on an emotional truth for five people. And when you get there, the factual truth kind of stops mattering. That wasn't exactly the answer to your question. It was very eloquent, <laughs> what it was. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, Jesse, yeah. where, where do you stand in your relationships with your parents and your brother and your sister uh, at the end of this, at this point in the process? Um, you know, everybody was really supportive of the book. It was, it was and has been super challenging for my sister because she is such a private person. And so suddenly she has people in her external life, like somebody at work who's like, I'm, I, I can't believe your dad is gay, right? Like that feels very intrusive. Um, and so, uh, like that, that's, I'm not gonna lie, like it's, it's hard. And the thing that I'll say about that hardness is that, um, like she's still very generous about it. She's still like, well, this is hard for me. I wasn't expecting it to be hard in this way. And also I would sign up to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that, I guess that's why I tell you the story of the hardness 
um, because I really wanted this book to have a happy ever after. And at the happy ever after, we all we all sit around the Thanksgiving table and we're like, that was a great book. And it's not like that. It's like life, right? And life is like hard all along, but also happy all along too. Yeah. So obviously this process changed your relationship with your parents, which as you said in the book was challenging. Um, did it impact your brother and your sister in that same way? Like, did you notice not just your dynamics with your family shifting, but your whole family dynamic shifting? Yes, and we thought about that a little bit beforehand, so we laid some ground rules. My parents were not allowed to, um, we, we all agreed, not allowed is not the right word, we all agreed that we would not call each other on the back end and be like, you know what, Jesse and I just had this conversation about that thing you said, and wow, can we process it right now? Um, and that was really, really helpful. Um, but yes, because, you know, my parents each had a coming out process when we were late adolescents. And my mother's was around realizing that she was the survivor of the series of crimes in her adolescence. My father's was realizing he was gay. And if you've ever been through anything um, in parallel to that in your own life, you know that like you become very self-absorbed while you're trying to save yourself. And you should, right? Like save yourself first in order to be there for others. And I don't think that my parents had had an opportunity to reflect on the impact that had on their kids. And for us as kids to be able to share that story, to be like, oh yeah, that definitely happened to you because I was in the room when it happened, um, was profound. It gave us a freedom that we didn't know that we needed. Anybody else? What, what's it like to be on the Today Show? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys. Okay, so Al Roker, Al Roker did the interview. It was a 45 minute interview. Network TV is not what it used to be. The Queen had died the week that they filmed it, which meant that all of the producers had gone to the UK, which meant that they were like, okay, well, we're, we're still going to tape this, but we're just going to have to send you some things in the mail and then put you on Zoom with a producer. So they, so they did this, and I'm like in my bedroom being like, this is not what the they show it's supposed to be real life, right? <laughs> so then like I finally get on the camera and Al Roker is there and you know the way that network TV works his producer had read the entire book she really really connected to it we had a very long conversation Al Roker gets on and he's like hi Jamie <laughs> and <then I> was, <laughs> okay well they edit this it's fine and then I was like you know, at this point there are seven producers in little zoom screens I can't see any of them they're all black and I'm like one of them should correct him, right? It's not on me to be like, hey, my, my name is Jesse, right? Like, how do you handle that? And so we did the whole 45 minute interview with him being like, and I just loved that part, Jamie. Where you were <laughs> so that was what it was like to be on the Today Show. <laughs> um, thank you seriously, everyone, for coming. Ben, did you have one more? I came in a little late, but I am curious what you're seeing, hearing or seeing from the LGBTQ community, how they're responding. Um, and so far it's been really fabulous. It's hard to say what the LGBT community like is. It's like so big and so diffuse, but it is a moment when, um, like, you know, I, I, I like that this book allows me to talk about, uh, being queer outside of the political realm, that it's, it's a very personal conversation. Cause really that's like, that's how my life works. My work, my life is a series of interpersonal relationships, right? And it is also true that it is a moment where the rights that I took for granted five years ago and celebrated are suddenly yeah. under attack. And that, that is really meaningful for the family that I've created with Francis. And um, it means things like, um, so in the state of New York, I am on my kid's birth certificate, even though Francis carried both of them. Now, if you had told 18 year old me that that, was, that would ever be so, that I would just, that would be amazing that that would, that would happen in my adulthood, in my lifetime. Um, but that is a state document, and if uh, marriage falls at the federal level, and our marriage is no longer considered legal at the federal level, then when I come to Mississippi, I won't be legally the, the parent to my children. So we are in the process of paying way too much money so that some judge can tell us for sure that I am the parent of our children. And I feel like that's like one little way in which the environment that we live in in 2022 is shifting. And we are super lucky because we can afford that adoption and I can get up here in front of you and complain about it. And what is true about <clears throat> most LGBTQIA people is that they're not in that position. And so a lot of groups um, have reached out to 
like have small conversations, small group conversations about it, see how they can use it in their own organization to inspire dialogue, because it is a book that is not political, it is a book that is about relationships and how we get along well with each other. And to me, that is like a profoundly important use of this text, that this text can be helpful in making families safer, ultimately. Like, it, that, that will be worth the two and a half years in a small room. I know some of you have to go. I'll just say that uh, your meeting with uh, Kelly and her wife or partner uh, was just one small indication of what this already means to some people. So. Thank you. All right, Jeff, thank you. All right, you're going to keep signing.